Some days. Some days. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some better days. Maybe they can yeah. just don't do that. Yeah. 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 Ten seconds. Bonjour. Merci. Nous sommes ici maintenant trois députés verts parce que nous avons tous les, les trois en notre cérémonie de, de, de cérémonie. Cérémonie? Anyway, we've all been sworn in now, duly. So the three uh, Green MPs wanted to review uh, on the eve of the speech from the throne and the opening of Parliament the agenda around climate. It's very pressing. As we all know, the negotiations in Madrid opened Monday. Uh, les, les négociations de COP25 a commencé lundi et la, la délégation de Canada était là maintenant, mais pas avec les ministres et les autres. The high-level segment of COP25 is the second week, and uh, I will be participating as a member of the Canadian government delegation uh, representing the Green Party. Uh, we've had it confirmed that all the parties in the House will be sending uh, representatives to participate on the official Canadian government delegation. And of course, that delegation will be led by Minister Jonathan Wilkinson. I'm still hoping that the Prime Minister can, and it's still open to him to decide to attend and to participate. It's very important to show to Canadians that this government cares as much about the Cold War security issues that are encompassed in NATO and uh, that we care as well about the 21st century security issues that are posed by the climate emergency. So there are a number of aspects of the negotiations at COP25 that are significant. Uh, there's been some media attention to Article 6. C'est la question des marchés de carbone mondial. C'est dans le cadre d'Article 6, dans uh, le traité de Paris. Uh, the details have not yet been finalized for how that will work. But the underlying urgency of the entire conference remains that all the targets that governments around the world have so far proposed and committed to collectively, monumentally fail to avert disaster. We know from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report of last October 2018 that going above 1.5 degrees Celsius is uh, a prescription for catastrophe at a global level. It's almost impossible to describe in terms that sound neutral or less than uh, alarmist what happens to the planet if we allow global average temperature increase to exceed 1.5 degrees Celsius. At the moment, we're on track as a global community to more than twice that. And that would spell the end of human civilization and potentially worse. So we know that all countries on Earth must improve their targets. But here we stand as a country, and just as a point of reference, it's always good to have a feet firmly on the ground for where we stand as a country. We committed in Kyoto to reduce emissions to 6 percent below 1990 levels. We should have done that in 2012. It was in our hands to do that. We actually had a plan to do it, uh, but it was canceled by Stephen Harper. We committed to 6 percent below 1990 levels as a first step in 1997. We are now at 17 percent above 1990 levels. And it's all too common in Canada to assume that other countries are in the same boat and haven't done any better. So just as a point of reference, uh, where the Prime Minister is today in London, the UK has achieved 38 percent reductions below 1990 levels. Most every country in the industrialized world that signed on for Kyoto achieved the targets and are now well below 1990 levels. So Canada's starting very far back. 
we need as a fossil fuel producing country to make it clear that fossil fuels are not our future and we need to come forward with a plan that takes us off fossil fuels. So speaking to these domestic targets and why we must achieve them, uh, first Paul Manley from Nanaimo Ladysmith will speak, Jenica Atwin, MP for Fredericton, will speak next, and uh, après je peux payer un petit résumé en français. Well, good afternoon, good morning. We're calling on uh, the government to not approve the Tech Frontier uh, new oil sands production. Uh, this is a 24,000 uh, square uh, hectare uh, project. It's one of the largest oil sands projects uh, in Alberta. Uh, last night I, I met uh, George McKenzie, the Grand Chief of the Tilcho First Nation, and uh, Joseph Gerard Cheesy of the Chief of, of Smith's Landing First Nation which is just across the border in uh, uh, the Northwest Territories. And they were not consulted. They were not part of the consultation, the environmental assessment on this project. They are downstream from this project, so they, they did not give free prior and informed consent uh, for this massive mine. It's one of the largest mines uh, in, in the oil sands. It's going to produce uh, 260,000 barrels per day when it reaches its peak. Um, it's expected to clear 3,000 hectares of old growth forest and 14,000 hectares of wetland will be lost. Uh, the mine's going to have a 41 year lifespan, so it takes it well beyond what the science is telling us uh, we need to do to, you know, with the oil sands in order to meet our climate uh, targets. So, Friend Tech Frontier is planning to operate through. 2066, which is completely unacceptable. So First Nations have said that, they're, that they don't want this project in their territory. They're, they're dealing with a border, which is a false line that, that flows through their territory. Um, it's been flagged by the, for environmental concerns by the panel, uh, including the removal of the old growth forest, the destruction of permanent, permanent uh, alteration of fish habitat, the release of large amounts of carbon pollution, the loss of wetlands, and areas of high species diversity potential. So Jeff Rubin, from the, uh, for the former chief economist for, with CIBC World Markets and a senior fellow at the Centre for International Governments and Innovation, said that it would require not only do we not see business as usual growth in world oil demand, but that we would see anywhere from 20 to 50 percent decline in world oil demand over the next 30 to 40 years, which would shut in production in places like the oil sands because their cost of production would no longer be supported by oil prices. So we're asking the government to not approve this project, to leave this uh, oil sand in the ground, and to, to work on a serious climate target. This oil sands project would end up filling half of the pipeline, the TMX uh, proposed new pipeline, which we also oppose. Thank you. And Janet, come out real quick. Um, so I'd like to begin by acknowledging uh, the Algonquin and Anishinaabe territory that we are speaking on today. Um, and that leads me into uh, the fact that Indigenous voices uh, as leadership in this conversation need to be highlighted. Um, we were at the gathering with the Assembly of First Nations last night uh, with the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, uh, Minister Wilkinson. He spoke to, the, to those gathered and he mentioned that the national, many national Indigenous organizations will be attending um, COP25 uh, as part of the Canadian delegation. I'm very glad to hear that. Indigenous voices are foundational uh, and to meaningful climate action. Um, and this is true at international conferences and it's true at home. Uh, nous ne pouvons pas nous attaquer la crise climatique sans également répaler des relations avec les Premières Nations. We must make passing legislation to implement UNDRIP a critical component of this session. And we must implement the recommendations of the inquiry report on missing and murdered Indigenous women. If we continue to abuse women, we will continue to abuse Mother Earth. I've often been told that Canada contributes only 1.6 of global emissions, but that ignores much of our global responsibility. Consumerism, international businesses and mining operations, waste exports, travel. Nous, notre responsabilité dans la lutte contre la crise climatique, c'est bien supérieur à 1.6%. C'est une question de leadership. We need a government to take the lead on the global stage, and we need a government to empower leaders here at home. We also need Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to come true on his Just Transition Act, supporting fossil fuel workers, enabling New Brunswick families, as an example, to remain intact, creating good jobs for them at home uh, in New Brunswick and across Canada. The Act needs to be in line with the recommendations that came out on the Commission on Just Transition for coal sector workers, but of course be applied to others in the fossil fuel industries as well. 
I think of other examples of leadership at home. Um, we're, we're going to Madrid, which is great to have these global conversations, but we also need to focus on our, our own backyard. I can think of so many great examples of leadership on the ground in my home riding. Um, to name a couple, I think of the Maliseet Nation Conservation Council and their work to implement indigenous protected conservation areas. I think this is a very important step forward on, on concrete action. I think of Mark and Megan McCann at MJM Solar installing solar panels on our Fredericton Public Library to reduce energy costs and engage the public in solar energy. These need to happen more and more. Um, we can have these high-level conversations, but if we don't bring it down to a meaningful community level, um, it's going to be more difficult for us to reach these targets. I think of all the companies connected with BioMB and the work that they are doing with biotech and the biofuel sector. I also think of the challenges they are facing and our role as government to remove some of those barriers to implement a better, faster way forward. Uh, I'm looking forward to the throne speech tomorrow. I'm very excited. It's my first opportunity. Um, and to finding ways to work with our colleagues in the House. I really want our message to be about collaboration and unity. We have to get to work. Uh, we have to do this together. Um, across party lines to combat the climate crisis and make it easier for us to do better. Um, the time is absolutely now. So thank you. Merci, and will you win? Merci. Je vais ajouter en français parce que c'est vraiment important de souligner que le Parti vert est absolument contre le mine de sable bitumineux Frontier Tech. C'est essentiel que le gouvernement refuse d'exploiter la mine de sable bitumineux Frontier Tech. Il y a un rapport de la le, 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 uh, revue environnementale pour Frontier Tech. Il était uh, uh, terminé dans l'été passé. Il a fait une recommandation vers lui. Uh, quand même, il a trouvé le dommage uh, sérieux vers l'environnement, comme Paul a dit, pour le, les forêts, pour, uh, pour les, les droits des peuples autochtones dans uh, les territoires. Uh, mais c'est vraiment absolument essentiel d'arrêter un nouveau mine sable bitumineux pour augmenter le niveau de gaz à effet de serre. Maintenant, nous sommes dans une situation d'urgence climatique. On doit agir, agir à Madrid et agir ici au Canada. So we're, we're ready for any questions you might have. Yes. Yeah. question on small modular nuclear reactors. Mm -hmm. um, put a press release against it this morning or, or last night. Um, like it or not, New Brunswick has an expertise in nuclear. Should it not build on that and build on that existing supply chain? I'd like to hear from you and then also Jenica as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, we know that the objective review of retubing Point La Pro from the New Brunswick Public Utilities Commission that was looking at exactly this question, what's good for the economy of New Brunswick? What's good for power supply for New Brunswick ratepayers? What's good for New Brunswick? Recommended against proceeding with wasting any more money on Point La Pro. The New Brunswick government politically decided to overturn the decision of the Public Utilities Commission and go ahead with massive expenditures in retubing Point Pro. So the problem with the term expertise is you can also substitute lobby. Deeply embedded in Ontario Hydro, deeply embedded in New Brunswick Hydro, are people who make their living building nuclear reactors. Um, it's been decades since Fred Nellman said um, nuclear industry is that nuclear is a future technology whose time has passed. There really isn't room in a carbon budget for wasting time or money on nuclear reactors, whether conventional can-do reactors or a new and untried smaller modular reactor. The idea of spending $27 billion of public funds uh, on an industry that's already been subsidized to the tune of $50 billion in public funds over the, the last number of years doesn't make economic sense. And it doesn't make sense for climate. It's just in the way. And Jenica, if you want to comment on New Brunswick. Well, I mean, I just, I question why it's so easy to put all this, this money and energy towards something that has had a history of, that's not perfect and requires more research and development and it requires a, a longer time frame. When we have the technology that exists for renewables right now, we're in a climate crisis, we need to act now. So I'm just, I'm confused as why this is, you know, the, the new exciting thing that we're going to be putting our attention towards in New Brunswick. And it seems to be, we, we constantly do this in my province as we kind of jump onto these um, seemingly exciting, uh, you know, quick fixes and we put all of our eggs in these in one basket and we're consistently disappointed. Um, so as I mentioned, some of the great examples of good things that are happening, let's continue to put our energy and our money, um, public funds, towards that. Um, so I just, we cannot support the, the small nuclear reactors. Just to follow up, Premier Higgs says the concerns base load, that they do want to replace the coal plant in Baldoon with cleaner energy, um, but wind and solar can't provide that base. 
you dispute that? Well, I mean, so I've heard that a lot, that it's not going to cover our energy needs. There's other things we can also look into. It's about diversifying. I think that should always be our, 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 our move forward. And again, it's putting too much energy and, and funding in that one direction, which is just not, not worth the risk. It's a gamble, and uh, it's not one I'm willing to support. If I can just re review um, the Green Party mission possible, which is our approach to achieve what science tells us we must do, 60 percent reductions below 2005 levels by 2030. And to confirm, I still hope the Prime Minister will change our target in the next few days so that we can be a positive force at COP25 in the negotiations. But when talking about baseload, one needs to look at the potential of, which is the first step in our plan, of expanding and linking our national electricity grid. There's more than enough power from Hydro-Quebec that could deal with the Maritimes issues to shut down coal much sooner. Uh, there's a very recent report, by the way, that was uh, in, in the neighboring province of Nova Scotia, developed by a group called Ecology Action Center that's vi that mirrors quite closely what the Green Party proposed in Mission Possible, but is really geared to, new, to Nova Scotia and says the same thing. We can go off fossil fuels right away in our electricity grid. So if you think of the grid as sort of a, as its own backup system, when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing, or if we get tidal going in, the, in Atlantic Canada, then you're, you're feeding into the grid because you've got more than you can use. And if you have a day when the sun isn't shining, the wind isn't blowing, you can pull from the grid because that's the way a grid system can work. We, we've had um, we've had this working on individual home bases, depending on what province you're in. But when you think big picture, a, a fully integrated, more robust electricity grid system that goes to 100 percent renewables is doable by 2030 and would completely decarbonize our electricity system and would also mean you didn't need – we wouldn't shut down existing operating reactors, to be clear, not, not right away. As they phase out their normal lifespan, we wouldn't put billions into retubing and trying to keep them going. But as that – as nuclear phases itself out, we would have 100 percent renewable energy that would provide exactly what big industry needs in terms of baseload. I don't want to find allowed. Um, is, does your support uh, of the throne speech, is that contingent on support for the abortion clinic in Fredericton? That's a very good question. Um, we haven't conferred on this, but yes. Yes, that and climate action. We've said we will not vote a single confidence vote for the Trudeau administration without a commitment to uh, having a climate plan that aligns with the advice of the, of the scientific community, which is becoming increasingly alarmed by the failure of countries like Canada to act, bearing in mind that a recent global survey found that of industrialized countries, Canada is third from the bottom. We're, we're slightly better than Saudi Arabia and Australia, but that's all. A couple of points about Canada's money. Um, you, you mentioned climate emergency. You've drawn an analogy to uh, wartime control yeah. of the economy. I think your belief is sincere. I take your word at it. But if that's the analogy, uh, I don't have to tell you that involved a degree of regulation, compulsion, community involvement. Mm -hmm. There was rationing. There was restrictions on private use of motor vehicles. Mm -hmm. There was control of the economy. You have a parliament a government that uh, in June voted a climate emergency, and yet I see no intangible community ways, evidence, that Rideau Hall or the PMO or Cabinet are doing anything that is unpleasant or inconvenient to send the message that it's not a theory. What should they do? Forgive me, not technology, not net zero 2050, okay. not electric cars. What should they do well, to send a message? Well, first of all, Tom, it's not about sending a message. It's about doing what's required. To clarify, we used a wartime analogy. We did not call for a wartime equivalent control of the economy. That would involve nationalizing everything. We do think, and we still believe, that it would be much better to have consensus decision-making around the climate emergency by bringing all parties into an inner cabinet that focuses on this issue. Uh, I think it's I think it's really important. Could, one could imagine Christian Freeland heading up such a smaller inner group that focused solely on what climate actions are required. What should they do 
If I were Prime Minister, I would start Parliament with an open session of hearing from the top scientists from around the world, answering every question till every MP understands the climate emergency. And then in real terms, you'd say we have to set a target that is aligned with the science. That's the first step. You can't it doesn't matter if you hit a target if it's the wrong target. We have to have the right target and then align actions and by sending a message, create the programs that allow a community to say we want to be part of this. That allows, you know, the hospital sector is an example. I've spoken to lots of people in the health field who are very concerned by the heavy carbon footprint of of, of the hospital sector. They'd like to bring that down. Well, maybe that's an alignment. There's, there's a group that wants to move, that could use government expertise to know how do we reduce our carbon footprint. And yes, it does matter to have an electricity grid that's 100 percent renewable. Decarbonizing the electricity grid is a first step. Energy efficiency and conservation really matter. Even if we're using 100 percent renewable, we don't want to waste it. Forgive me. I, I, I don't want to interrupt. It's a climate emergency. Yes. The secretary to the Governor General will fly to Fredericton for a swearing in because you can't get that on YouTube. It's a climate emergency, but it's Christmas lights across Canada. Mm. Do you see where I'm headed with this? Well, it's a climate emergency, but the Prime Minister doesn't walk to work. Though we've had other Prime Ministers do that, right. and this is not in ancient times. Right. Do you see where I'm headed? Yeah, well, the, it, it comes from the top. Right, exactly. But the Prime Minister, for instance, we know that in the times when the Prime Minister used to walk to work, they were pre-9-11. I don't think the RCMP would allow Justin Trudeau to, to stroll down. It's certainly walkable distance. But the vehicles in which he traveled could be electric, and the grid which is fueling those vehicles, could be 100 percent renewable. That's what's important. The immediate infrastructure of this country right now is hardwired to fossil fuels. It need not be. Within 10 years, we could, we could have a 100 percent decarbonized electricity grid. Within 10 years, we could shut down the oil sands and have taken care of all the workers so they have put their work and their, their transferable skills to work in jobs they want that are important in Alberta. It's very important that we have a plan that is not just, um, well, some of the things that you might suggest as virtue signaling, like the Prime Minister would, would stop taking planes. I would think that he could take fewer planes. I try to take fewer planes, but I fly to work. I'm a British Columbia Member of Parliament. There is no way for me to do my job for my constituents without flying. I take trains when I can, and Jenica and her family came up by train from New Brunswick. It is possible to reduce greenhouse gases in how we conduct ourselves day to day. But where a government that says we're in a climate emergency needs to act is to have a target that's consistent with recommending, recognizing we're in a climate emergency. If we're in a climate emergency, you don't build a pipeline. If you're in a climate emergency, you don't approve Tech Frontier Mine. There are large-scale polluting activities being approved by this government today, and in the case of Trans Mountain, approved with public funds that you simply do not do if you understand you're in a climate emergency. That's the leadership we need. Wait, you get not walking, not well, walking to work. You get to the podium. That's Please. the leadership that we need. Not not walking to work, but actually saying no to tech resources, no more expansion, no new projects in the oil sands, and no expansion of the Trans Mountain pipeline. So let's work on reducing our emissions. Let's work on reducing production and switching over to a renewable energy economy. We can use the resources that we have as we're transitioning, but we do not need to be exporting raw bitumen from this country. Uh, you know, for a, for the tax base, it doesn't make any sense. And if you look at at Alberta, you know, it, it was clear that they get, they earn more money from alcohol and t tobacco taxes and gaming than they do from oil and gas revenue. And so the idea that they need to sell more oil and gas to build hospitals and schools is a myth. And we need to put the lie to that myth and 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 be straight about this. You know, they're giving the resource away at 1% royalty rate, it's exporting raw product from this country, and destroying the environment in the process, and destroying our climate in the process. And we need leadership, not the Prime Minister walking to work, but saying no to the oil sands projects, saying no to tech, tech um, frontier. frontier. Neither, Mr. Manley. I know, I know he's not, and so That's it's a huge we're disappointment. We're not going to be voting for the speech from the throne unless we see action on these, on these items. Can I ask a question about personalities? I want to approach this delicately. Mr. Wilkinson has a reputation as an earnest technocrat, uh, in marked contrast to his predecessor, who, whether you accept it or not, was a divisive figure, did not seem really well-schooled in her legislation, liked to cite anecdotes 
goats when um, insisting that opponents of the program were unfeeling, didn't care about the kids, oblivious to the, the deaths of seniors, etc. Do you welcome the Wilkinson approach? Is it too late? Do you acknowledge there's a difference in the approach that cabinet has try, is trying something different as they wait for Supreme Court references and the rest of it? Well, to comment on personalities is not something I tend to do. I certainly think that uh, I would welcome the Wilkinson approach when I know what it is. So far, we haven't, you know, he's, he's getting up to speed on his files. Um, I have had very uh, a good but brief conversation with him about COP25. I, I understand the door is still open to the Prime Minister attending. I think that's a very good signal that they're considering it. Uh, the Prime Minister has a lot of global cachet. As I sometimes say, people around the world don't know why we're all so angry with him. So uh, in the context of global climate negotiations, where the September 23rd UN summit that was supposed to deliver on elected national leaders showing up with better targets. That did happen, but mostly from developing countries, mostly from smaller players, saying we will hold to a target that is net neutral, uh, carbon neutral by 2050, but with steps all the way along. We have a liberal platform that said that Canada would be at zero carbon, net zero, by 2050 with legislation that brings it along in increments. When does that legislation start? The minute that I hear Minister Wilkinson say that the legislation will come forward, that he looks forward to working with the Green Party, the Bloc, the NDP, the parties that really want to move on climate, that the five-year increments start in 2020, 2025, 2030, that lead us to a very different target by 2030 with a plan that goes with it. Then I'll welcome the Wilkinson approach. But we, we need to know what the plan is. We need to know where the legislation is. We want to make sure that they're not going to try to fudge it and say 2030 target is more or less okay or we'll tweak it a little. And then we'll start the five-year increments, 2030, 2035. Five-year increments have to start now, and they have to start with a real commitment to global climate action. I think, I mean, I, I, um, I, I don't uh, lament by any means a change in minister, and I hope the best that uh, Minister Wilkinson will deliver on what the science requires of us. It's not about personalities, and it's not about partisanship. It should only be about the science. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Any other questions for us? Okay. Did, it, did uh, Paul or Jenica, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Okay. Merci tout le monde. Nous sommes comme vert. What? Nous sommes début. So we're looking forward to the work we can do together. Uh, three times as many members as when I was sworn in last time. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for coming. Merci.